I want you to open up your Bibles, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, please. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then I also want you to go to Proverbs chapter 4, please. Proverbs chapter 4. Now, what I'm going to give to you is a lot of good arguments that you can use to debunk people who try to use science on you. Now, we do believe in science because we believe in observation, testing, and experimenting things. And if you do that, you're going to get closer to the Bible. You're going to get closer to God, not toward evolution. You're going to get far away from that. But you're going to deal with atheists who like to use science as if it's the infallible God for every answer out there. And then what you're going to do is that you're going to show them why their scientific arguments have a lot of fallacy. So I'm going to give you some good tips. These are logical arguments, logical methods used to debunk scientists out there when they like to use science as their getaway card. Now the first thing to understand is this. The Bible, it warns you about this at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20. We're not against science right here, but what we're against is science falsely so called. So that's the key you got to understand. They will use science for their arguments, but it's used in a false way. That's something important to understand. Not only that, notice your Bible carefully words so-called, right? So that's important to understand. It's as if they word it, they say it. But just because you say it doesn't mean it's science. That's important to understand. So when they say words science, 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 that shouldn't scare you. Remember that. It's just a so-called. Falsely. So in other words, that this is incorrect. Now the Bible already gave you two clues on how you can argue and demolish their scientific arguments. The key is so-called. It's just word of mouth. It's not really science. Another thing right here, it's falsely. They're using it incorrectly. So these are two methods that the Lord already gave you. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. We do believe in using wisdom. We do believe in using wisdom. So one, two, and then three is wisdom. So philosophy, in case you didn't know, philosophy means lover of wisdom. So it is, so we can use wisdom or philosophical methods where we can debunk the arguments right here. So let's look at Proverbs chapter four, and then we'll read verse five. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So it is important that we should seek and love wisdom. So the Bible already gave you three clues on how you can deal with the academia realm when they like to use science on you. Now, the Bible also warns about philosophy at the book of Colossians. But the key is the, that when you look up philosophy at the book of Colossians, it has to do with, with the humanistic concept, not divine, God-spirit-filled concept. If it follows the Bible, you should use wisdom that follows the Bible, not wisdom that follows man's thinking. See, that's the idea. Okay. So now let's use these three methods to debunk the arguments of science. The first thing concerning science, how you can debunk it, is that within science, one of the fallacies within the scientific world is concerning about observation. Observation. What is the definition? Okay, let's look at the basic thing about science, theory, and hypothesis. What is the basis of all this? So concerning hypothesis, oh, excuse me, <laughs> I spelled this wrong. Hypothesis, theory, and science, the basic of all these definition, it requires observation. That is what is required within science. It requires observation. Now, here's the problem with this argumentation. The problem is this, is that within the, within the eyes of different people, how they observe things, it's going to be different. 
So even though you're doing the observation experimentation, the problem is your observation could be in a different plane, different mindset. What do you mean by that, preacher? For example, if I were to open up a radio box right here, I see all these wires like this. When I observe it, how do I see it as? I see it as all these wires are just all over. What is this? Yeah. But then within a person who's into electronics, he sees it as connections with each other communicating something. Yeah. See, the idea is this. Why? Because the mindset of the electronic person was already trained, mm -hmm. was already taught something else. So his mindset, because he already has that mindset, when he sees it, he's going to see it as his perspective. The mindset of a person who is not into electronics, but let's say the mindset of the person is into reading books, for example. He's a book reader. So then when he looks at that, all he sees is wires. So because of that, his mindset of words and letters and ideas is, not going, is going to think differently with those wires. That's why it makes so much sense why evolutionists do not convert to creationism. Because they're majoring in their field, and that's their mindset already built into that. So because of that, when they're doing observations with certain uh, experiments or certain evidences out there, they already have that mindset that's already communicated to them when they observe. Does that make sense to you? So in other words, it's this. There is no such thing as an absolute neutral playing field within science. That is nonsense. A professional scientist would not believe in that either, if he is really honest. I mean, I studied research methods and all that. That's totally impossible to do it completely from a neutral plane. You can try, you can attempt to do so, but, is it, but it doesn't change the fact what your mindset's already built. For example, a good example is the Earth. So uh, during the ancient Greek days, in their observation, they can use all the logical reasonings and experimentations where they can prove it's flat. And, but to the scientist's mind, when they look at the Earth, they will see it as round. They're going to see it as round because they're going to go from their mindset of their experiments of how it can prove curvature. But guess what? Today, now we got flat earthers. And flat earthers, when they observe something within the Earth, where they see it as curvature, they might see it as flat. Where they see as something where it might prove something round, they might see it as more evidence concerning flatness. Yeah. See, so that's the idea. So, it doesn't, so there's no such thing as a neutral plane within science evidences. Yeah. There's no such thing. Your mindset is already built to that. Mm -hmm. So observe, it depends on what you observe. See that? That's why creationists, they always argue this. What they always argue against evolutionists, which is a really good argument, and this is what Ken Ham tried to point out in his debate with Bill Nye. But it's not going to work. Debates don't work like that. But they're, uh, they're ignoring an important point from Ken Ham. You can take a scientific evidence out there, but to a creationist mindset, it will prove intelligent design. It will prove immediate on the spot it was made. Whereas an evolutionist mind, he will see it as something gradual, something that's related to each other. Yeah. See that? So it, observation is going to skew it. The second thing is the nature of the observation. It's going to be the nature of the observation. So in other words, this kind of relates to this one almost, but it's a slightly different. This one is depending on the mindset of what you see. But this one is more depending upon what you already believe in theory. So in other words, bias. See that? So because you're already bias prone, and it's impossible to separate bias within a normal human being. Every human being has bias. If you claim that you're neutral, you're a liar. All right? Even an atheist will admit that he has bias in his mind. If he's an honest atheist, okay? No atheist will be dumb to say he doesn't have bias. Everyone is prone to bias. So the idea is this, is that when you observe something, the problem is this, you already have a theory already in your mind, you already have a bias in your mind. And because of that, it's going to change your observation. It's going to change what you observe with that uh, thing that you're experimenting, with that evidence, and you're going to try to use it in a way that will support your theory. Because if you see something within the observation that supports your bias, you're going to use it. Now, this is very interesting in research methods classes. There, is, there are cases of many professors 
who when they've done observations and then they've done research methods, they found out that it conflicts their theory and they hate that. So because they hate that, a lot of them will do retries with the experiments because they refuse to yield. And that is taught by a research methods professor that I was studied under in graduate school. That's what they teach right there. Majority of them, they're not neutral like you would think. They're not objective. The majority are biased. That's what, they, that's what he teaches. You know why? How much money was spent already on the project? Exactly. How much do you think it will change all your textbooks and academia world? That's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Not only that, your whole life was spent supporting this theory, yeah. your God evolution. What's going to happen after that? Yeah. What do you think that the higher-ups are going to do with you? They're going to give you a lower position. Yeah. They're going to call you a mad scientist, pseudoscientist. Yeah. Think about that for a while. The third thing right here is concerning induction, the problem of induction. Oh, by the way, let's use scripture for these two things. The, you know what the answers to these two are in scripture? It's already answered for you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. We believe this. We believe in using observations, but we don't deny the fact that there is an element of faith here. See, that's what these two are. These two are, whether you believe it or not, it is an element of faith there, Amen. what you already believe, without actual proof, without actual neutrality. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, now faith is the substance. See, you take a substance. You can observe and test. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence. It is evidence that you take. But notice of things not seen. Yeah. The Bible told you that there is a fallacy within observation already, that there is faith. Another problem is induction right here, induction. Concerning induction, what it is, is that it's a generalization, and that's a matter of fact within science. You might say, what do you mean? What I mean by that is there's a difference with induction and deduction. Deduction, what this is, is that it takes premises. And once you have true, so these are true premises, not just any premise. It's got to be a true premise. Once you have true premises, then the conclusion has to be a true conclusion as well. So it has to be. That's how, that's how the idea works. But induction cannot, use, cannot do that. In other words, it can be fallacious. Why are, why are inductions can be fallacious? Because you can take, uh, let's say for example, that you can prove out there that every furry creature that's going to be a four-footed creature that's a land animal anything that has fur out there. And then you can take every experiment, you can even do thousands, you can do hundreds, and every case you've done that, you've proven it. But does that mean you covered every furry creature around the world? No. You can have a bill, a, a, a creature with a bill like the platypus, for example, who's covered with fur, or any other kind of creatures out there who has fur. So you gotta realize this, is that within induction, it's a gen generalization. It's a generalization. Deduction, it makes, it cannot be done that way because it takes premises that leads to a true conclusion. That's the thing. Within induction, however, you can take as many as you want, but it'll still be a generalization. It doesn't have premises that has to lead to a true conclusion. The conclusion is based on what you generalized. The conclusion is based on what you've taken within everything. See that? But it doesn't mean that it covers everything out there. It only covers everything what you covered right there. So that's the thing with induction. But the thing is, is that within Christianity, it is deduction right here. You might say, why is that? Why can't we use deduction right here? The reason why we can use deduction right here is based on these actual premises right here. And these can be found in my teachings concerning about the existence of God, right? Why does God exist? So I've already done that. I use the laws of thermodynamics on this, right? So there are only four possibilities no matter what. So then through this, you're going to have to add the premises and lead to a conclusion. You're either going to have to say that the universe always existed. You're going to either have to say that um, it was created by nothing. You're going to have to actually say that it's an illusion. And then you're going to have to say that either that something supernatural or something outside the realm of science did it. That's the problem right there. But if you don't like the word supernatural, because that might not be an actual premise, you can use this. You can use designer. That's an actual premise that's proven true. 
So even if you don't like the word supernatural, then use the word designer. And that's even worse. That will prove it's not just some supernatural thing. It's an actual person. So that will make it worse for you. So these are only four premises that you can go by. And when you add these four premises with the other premise that we were all created. So mankind created one premise. We all believe in that. We all came from something. And then the second premise is one of these four. And then you have to make a true conclusion no matter what. That's the idea. Within science, however, science admits this. It's not 100% proven true. Within a theory, hypothesis, everything. They have to only go by the best explanation because they always leave out the, because they know this, it is induction. It doesn't cover every absolute out there. Yeah. See, that's the idea. But you can't do that with deduction right here. Deduction, it covers all actual premises. And when you add actual premises, it has to, it has to, it has to, within logical reasoning, it has to lead, lead to an actual conclusion. Uh, another thing right here concerning about the fallacy is falsification. Falsification. So let's put this as a different color. So here's the idea of science as to justify them. Scientists, they will claim that, no, actually, we do like to know where our theory and our hypothesis is proven to be false. If we did, then we can make a breakthrough in history. We, I can become famous. And not only that, to be fair, within scientific methods, that is the goal of scientific theory. It's to actually falsify. That's the idea. It's to actually falsify. That's the idea. So within falsification, within the scientific method, um, it's falsification. But why is this used to support our side, you might say? Why is this used to support our side? The reason why is this is because evolution, do you realize how many falsifications are there? They just don't want to discuss it as much. They don't want to debate as much about this one. For example, Nebraska man, Lucy, and etc. So all these things that they're arguing concerning about the bone structure and etc., it's a huge leap to say that we're related to them just because there's something within their human feature that looks like us. How do you not know that's a unique species that went extinct? So it takes one, here's another thing about falsification. It doesn't matter how many 100 experiments you do, there is one thing that proves falsification, it's false. What makes something false is that if it's not true. And even if you prove 99, 99 times it's true, it only makes one thing to make it false. It only takes one thing to make it not true. So in other words then, evolution should be the easiest for Christians to debunk then. It shouldn't be difficult. All you need is one. All you need is one. So we covered, I'm not going to cover it in this teaching, but what did I cover throughout all the teachings concerning evolution? We covered all their arguments, right? We covered their fossil record. We covered their geology. We covered uh, their concerning about the similarities within DNA and their body structure, their biology that se seems to show a relationship. We also uh, covered concerning about, let's see, we covered fossil record, geology. We covered mutations. We covered natural selection. We covered all the fallacies concerning that. Now, the problem is they're not, with those falsifications, how then can you say this is 100% true that we come from evolution then? Why do you believe in that? See, it doesn't change the fact you have faith over there. So falsification, that's the problem right there. It only takes one, and that should be the goal of the scientific theory. So my question is this, why didn't they do that then? Sure, you might have uh, evidences right there where carbon-14 dating might support your theory, but then you, if you cover carbon-14 dating, you're going to also cover other areas where it's proven to be very young, the earth, etc., and certain objects. Not only that, carbon-14 dating, there are fallacious sides to it as well, concerning the environment, how it affects it. So see, you've got to consider these factors. They don't do that. They don't do that right there. Another problem concerning science, which is the most dumb argument, and I already covered this, it's scientivism. What does this mean? In other words, science has all the answers. So any other answer out there that is not science, it's not the answer. That is the most stupid argument ever. Don't ever believe in this nonsense right here. Just because you can't say everything over there, science has all the answers out there. You can't do that, okay? Don't say that, please. The idea is this, is that there are answers that we use out there that does not rely solely on science. 
And I've already covered those arguments concerning those factors. Here's another problem. Another problem is this. What if, if you insist that science has all the answers, my question to you is this. What are you going to do with the possibility that's outside the physical universe? You know what the definition of science is? The definition of science is the natural workings of the physical universe. What are you going to do with something outside of that? It doesn't have the answer for that one. So you take by faith then that there's nothing outside the physical universe. See, that's faith right there. Well, why do you believe in it? It's because I observed, I experimented. That's why it must be true. Didn't you know that during the ancient Greek days, there were things they could not observe, they could not experiment? For example, I'm not saying I believe in this, but, there are, but you liberal scientists, you believe that we landed on the moon. Do you think the ancient Greek philosophers can do that? So they can't land on the moon and tell you what's everything that's in the moon over there because they didn't observe or experiment what's actually on the moon over there. So you all take by faith. Here's another thing. There are even science, scientific experiments that you didn't observe and experiment for yourself. You just took by faith what the textbook said right there. See, so that's the problem. Not only that, if you do want to make the scientific experiment yourself and prove it, you have to have money for it. You have to have all the backup for it. And not only that, there are certain government restrictions and laws concerning that. So there are some things that you are not allowed to observe and experiment. So here's my argument right here. I argue this. I think that scientifically, this is my personal opinion, if you keep using science, you will eventually see God, heaven, and everything. But we can't reach that far. Why? Because God does not allow it. He allows limitations. That doesn't prove that it's not scientific, it's not real. See that? So here's the idea, because like today, there are certain things that are limitations that we can't observe and experiment either, but we take by faith it's science. Why can't we do that with God? Why can't we do that with God? Hmm? Because if you study all the scientific evidences, there is one irrefutable fact when you study science. There is absolutely no way you can take by faith for billions of years that from nothing we are what we are today. That is impossible when you study DNA. That is impossible when you look at everything that works in our universe. It's going to collapse easily. It will always collapse. It will always become an accident. It will always make things worse. You have to have somebody so intelligent to make it all at once. That is an irrefutable fact when you study science. Look at all the complexities of biology, nature, universe, astronomy, geology, etc. That is an irrefutable fact. Amen. Okay, so I hope that you can use these arguments that will be helpful for you concerning where people think that science has all the answers.